Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, sometimes Justin, occasionally John. You know, you know how it goes. Hi, everybody. Yes, yes. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hello. It's Friday, Friday edition, which means like it's cold in here. <laughs> so I'm, so I'm flanneled, but um, yes. Ah, it's a little chilly in the, our house in the morning. At least this time of year. As we get into winter, I'm going to insist upon upping the, the temperature, but for now I can, I can suffer. <laughs> Hello, Kitty Palooza. Happy Friday indeed. I'm very happy that it's Friday. Alrighty, let's hear. We are bluing today. Oh, and of course, I forget my palette because that seems to be what I do every day this month. Jeez, one sec. It's like, geez, I'm all set. I already got my paint out. I got my mini. I'm all ready, except I'm not because I need my palette. Can't paint much without palette. So we're going on Darius. We did his skin tones last time. Let's get my granny glasses online here so I can see things. Aha, I can see things. Yeah, he's really pallid. He's really pallid and, and pasty. Um, and I did mention we might do some pink tones around his nose, didn't I? Yeah, like that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's see, what pink do I wanna go? I don't wanna go too, too much because uh, that just won't look good. I think I'm going to use Dragon Red. Mix it with a little bit of our Cairnstone, which is what we were using for his skin to yellow it out and make it more pasty and old person-ish. Um, I'm just going to go with a tiny bit and see what I can do. And usually, this is this is always how I create rosy, skin, rosy bits for skin tones. Always how I create blush. It's always how I create lip color. Um, is to take the base kind of skin tone that we have. And actually, I, I used a little bit of desert sand too, so I'm going to come in with a drop of that. Take that that you've done and add just a tiny bit of a, usually a dark red to it. If you use a brighter red, it's going to be much more bright pink and not as organic looking. But if you use something like dragon, or my favorite is usually deep red, which is 9002 but I had dragon close to hand, so that's what we're gonna to use today. Um, but usually I'll use something with some, some green in it, some black in it, some blue in it, just because it's a little more muted, it's a little more natural. I mean, if you look at your lip color, it's not a super bright pink unless you're wearing lipstick. So let's mix that in. And that's very subtly pink, very taupey almost, interesting. Yeah, boy, I'm happy it's Friday. We went out to dinner last night. We had a very nice dinner. Even if even if David wanted a, glut wanted a glutinous dessert. Glutinous and gluttonous, actually. I'm gluten-free, so I, I try to avoid it most of the time, but I allow myself to have it every once in a while because I'm not a celiac. It's a dietary choice. All right, so that's kind of a very subtle pink. I'm going to do that. I'm going to use that. I may need to get it a little darker, though. We'll see. Yeah, I'm not into it. I'm not into the lipstick thing. Well, for one thing, you can't even see his lips. He is totally not, um, like, his beard is... He probably grew his beard long just so he didn't have to put on lipstick every day. You know, that's probably the story. But his, his rat could tell on him, but uh, he's mum for now. Yeah, I think I want a little bit more red in this. It's really, really, yeah, 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 I want just a little bit more. It's um, kind of a dangerous path here because I just, I don't want it to get too pink. I just want something that looks natural. That might be okay. But I need something that actually will stand out, which means if it's too pale, you're not even going to notice the rosy color. So I'm going to put this on his nose. And then maybe actually bring in some darker. Yeah, see, that's still really light. So you really can't see it. You really can't tell. 
This is the thing with really light colors is the color of it, even if it looks strong here, it will not show up when you put it on a tiny little area. So even though you might think you want something really pale, what you will find is that you need to make it darker or more vivid than you think in order to make it stand out on the model. So we're gonna keep tuning this. Yeah, he really is Merlin. He's, he's very much a Merlin. Ron likes Merlin type wizards. <coughs> He cannot lie. He really likes the pointy hat old guy wizard. That's Ron. All right. So that's much, much more pink. It's darker. This has a chance of actually showing up. Let's see here. Back to brush. And let's see if this shows up a bit. Yeah, that's actually giving me a little bit, at least in person. It's hard to tell on screen, I know. But it is showing a little bit of pink, you can see. So that's actually pretty good. I like that. I'm gonna bring it back to the nostrils. He's got a very long nose. But that brings a bit of color into his face. And I can also suggest just a little bit of that in the uh, area under the cheekbones. I don't want to totally change the face color. Also make a note, the more you introduce rosy tones into your skin tone, the less evil someone is going to look. It's, um, you can do a, a rosy skin tone evil person, but it has to be very evident through them, through their expression and their accoutrements that um, they are evil. Because the more rosiness is friendly, generally, perceived as friendly. And so if you want to make Darius a really wicked wizard, then you've got to keep that in mind. Let me grab my brown liner. I want to kind of line around the beard a bit. Hello, Bob and Julie. Good morning. I was just adding some rosy tones to the nose. Let's see here. Yeah, you can see it's a little bit pink now. Still is not showing up great, which is why I'm actually going to grab some liner and see what I can do to make the features of his face, tiny as they are, um, come out. I'm going to actually do a one-to-one -one with brown liner because everything is very fair. And brown liner, remember, the nice thing about the liners in general is the more you thin them, the more subtle of a line you'll get. And so when you're working with such a dark paint to line against such a fair skin tone, you really want to uh, do that. You really want to de-emphasize it. You want a little bit of dark to bring in those details, but you don't want to overdo it. So I'm going to mix my pink actually with a little bit of this brown liner to make kind of a taupe color. And then I am going to come in and try to get that uh, the nostril there defined and the shadow under the nose. And getting tiny details like this to stick is just like a function of brush control. It's why whenever you paint, you should try to hold your brush in roughly the same position and just move the model around so you can constantly have a comfortable grip on your brush. Do that and you will acquire muscle memory slowly over the course of the minis that you paint. And it will allow you to do those tiny little details and when I get really close, it seems like those those details are showing up. They're huge, right? But when you back off, you get more the look, um, the more more look of subtlety because that, we're getting very close on his face here in this video. So it makes it look like I've overdone everything. But in reality, when you're doing 28 millimeter, you have to overdo things. If you want things to show up, you have no choice. That's why lining is a thing because only through accentuating the shadows more than you think you should 
are you going to be able to really pick out those details so that they show up when you back off from the figure? Hey, Dwarving. Yeah, Beholders are fun. Which one is it? Is it the Nolzer's, um one from WizKids? That's a really good Beholder. Even I have that Beholder. I just haven't had the oomph to uh, actually prep it, re-prep it, I should say. Soggy Bellingham, huh? We are not soggy here in the South Bay area, but we are definitely cold. That's why why it's flannel day for Anne. All right, I'm just gonna keep my skin tone colors. I'm gonna remix them a little bit. I'm gonna do a mix of um, desert sand and cairnstone up here. Remember, we're using very non-conventional skin tones on him because we want him to be very pale um, and you know and to appear elderly. And so that means usually. Uh, going a little bit more yellow, a little less pink with the skin tones, and uh, for him, I'm even going further and, and really graying out some areas. I also want the lighting to be evident, so I'm doing that. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to stick with that dramatic of a lighting, though, because uh, if I go really dramatic with it, that means that his face is going to be in shadow if I make the light come from this direction. I don't really want to have to deal with that, so I'm probably going to bring this hand back up a little bit. Um, I'm still going to have a shadow on the underside because there would be one, but not so dramatic. This is very much more like, almost like a comic book style where you darken down your shadows extremely um, and you get, that's how you get a dramatic lit effect. Like he looks like he's got a bright light shining on his hand. It's because the shadows are so dark. Um, and that is, that's how you get that effect. If you want a very bright light on a surface is you make the shadow darker and you make it very abrupt transition. Let me grab my water and thin down this skin tone. I'm going to um, bring that a little bit back up. Yes, correct. But you can do that in a movie because the character has actions. With a miniature, you must do it in the surroundings or in the color or in, you know, you must, you don't have all of those tools so like you'd you'd need to do it maybe in the basing or in the what's in the book or you know you have to play with the environment in a static sort of way in miniatures so all righty let's get this uh underside of the hand just a little bit more highlighted now the nice thing is that since i put in this shadow remember how when you have a darker base coat anything you put over it is darker so i can take the skin tone and put it right over this shadow and it'll actually produce a blended effect because the uh, shadow is going to make my color even though it's a white um, or an off-white and it has a lot of coverage i've thinned it so a little bit of that shadow is still going to carry so you can actually use that effect not just to have your your lights come out more but you can use it to create more subtle shadows because whatever you put over the top of this darker shadow is going to look darker even if it's the same color as the base coat which this is so a little bit more light there so it's not quite as stark of a shadow still have a little bit too much there so i can glaze or i can paint over glaze this one and I'll just take the excess off remember never leave your glaze sitting around in puddles or you will get bad coffee stain marks when you try to uh, after it dries it will it will be sad you will not like it unless you're trying for weird coffee mark coffee stain special effects and I have yet to meet the person who has effectively used that to do something I'm sure there's somebody somebody will have found a use for that artifact yeah, I'm just using water yoat. I um I really don't like using mediums in my glazes. I use uh I use our brush on sealer when I build washes because I like then the kind of like almost gummy or gooey um the the texture that it adds to the paint 
Um, that just makes it more translucent. I like it in that situation, but when I'm doing glazes, I really don't like that texture. I like just having it thinned with water. And a lot of people really like glazing medium. They use it, um, and sometimes it'll do things like increase your open time, so it'll keep your glaze from drying you know, a little for a little bit longer, but I just don't like the, the skin over kind of texture thing it does, so I just don't use it. I don't find it's necessary. So, I mean, your mileage may always vary and you should always try varying uh, ways to do glazing yourself and decide which one works for you. I tend to be real fast with my glazes and I tend to also spot glaze a lot. So I'll just put a, like a tiny little glaze on something. And for that water is just fine. I don't need, I'm not putting a glaze all over the back of a cape. Um, but even with that, even if I was, I would just use a big brush and go over the area super fast and I'll have plenty of time to wick off the extra moisture afterwards. So yeah, so it's it's really, it's a kind of a style thing. It's just what you get used to doing. I always encourage people when they're learning to try all sorts of different stuff because that way, because whatever you, you kind of use is what you fall into. And a lot of us don't question it because it works for us. It, it takes a pretty enlightened mindset as a painter to constantly be trying new things and to go back to old things you didn't like at first and give them another chance. I think it's highly effective to do that, but a lot of people find it very difficult. So instead I tend to recommend to people that they try things in the, in the early days before they've settled into something. And then they can make more of a choice about, oh, well, I tried both of these things and I had better success with this thing. So I'm gonna go with this thing for now. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think I want my liner just a little bit darker though for around the face. So I'm going to add another drop. Now that I've done that nose, the nose thing, and I'm going to back out on this. So yeah, so now you can see the details of the nose even at a distance. And that's good. And I still feel like I need it just a little pinker though. Just a little pinker. It's not quite where I want it. I'm going to add one drop to my liner just to bring it a little bit back in the solid direction. so that I get a darker line on some of this stuff, which is nice how you can tune liner that way. I enjoy it. Uh, all right, let's add one more drop of pink to our pink nose color, or one more drop of uh, dragon red, rather. You know, I just noticed that the mouse looks very disgruntled. Like, he's got a frowny face on him. Like, he's like, you dumb wizard, what are you doing? <laughs> I had a role-playing game where the wizard had a sentient border collie, as is familiar. He was a Scottish wizard, and he had a Scottish um, border collie familiar. And uh, that dog was far better at spellcasting, like far more educated than the wizard was. It was actually pretty funny. And the player was good enough that he could, you know, have his wizard say something and then have the border collie disparage it right away. <laughs> And they're both doing like, both do talking in Scottish accents. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really funny. I think it's a rat. I mean, it's got a ratty tail. I mean, so do mice, but it's big. It's the size of a rat. So I have to assume that it's a rat. We have not named the rat. I just don't have, a, don't have enough character here yet to have a, a name for the rat. But I just noticed that he's definitely got a frown on his face. Like he's definitely, and he's kind of like got a scrunchy eyebrow too. So he's definitely not happy with whatever the wizard is doing right now. So I've got my darker pink going on. So let's hit that nose. That's a little bit better. It's starting to be a little bit, it's starting to really come out with that color. So I have to be careful. We don't want to go cotton candy pink with it. We just want a little bit of rosiness. There, I'm a little happier with that. And then a little bit of my skin tone to make a highlight for it. There, all right, that's good. I'm happy with that, I think, for now. I could sit, it's so, when you've got such a little tiny face to do, it's easy to sit and just fiddle with it and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But eventually you have to remind yourself that it's gonna change its look as you add everything around it. So you really gotta kind of put it aside, call it soft done and get them put it aside. I'm actually gonna block in his eyeballs 
Uh, I think I want to use, I want to use an off-white for this for sure. I think I'm actually, actually going to use like Undead Flesh, which is weird, but this is actually a pretty good eyeball color. It's greenish and it has grayish tones, yellowish, gray, yellowish greenish tones, but it's also an off-white and, and such tiny areas, it's, you're not going to see the green at all, but it will register that it's not a pure white and that's what we want. Using pure white for eyes, I usually reserve only for the tiniest of eyes, like the Tom Meyer sculpts um, in Dark Sword Miniatures lines where Tom just sculpted the most tiny, infinitesimally uh, tiny line, eyeballs that you ever would see. Um, and they're super hard to paint and it's super hard to get a pupil in them and an expression. So for those, I'll use pure white because I usually only get like this tiny micron of paint in there to suggest a white. That's a pretty good one, Pendrake. I like that. And Miles is like, you're totally gonna summon a cat. Yeah, that's a super fun. That's a super fun one, you at Beth. Alrighty, let's get this. I may have thinned this too much. I'm used to uh, pretty heavily pigmented whites and off the top of my head, I can't remember how much pigment is in undead flesh, how much white pigment is. Not very much is the answer. We're getting a very dark white. I'm going to add one more drop then of my paint. We don't want the white to be really stark here because he's got those big heavy eyebrows, but we want that white to be there enough that it'll let us do an expression. So I need to thicken it just a little bit more. So it's like My Fair Lady then with wizards dwarving. Eliza Doolittle is the wizard. And he has terrible pronunciation. Eliza's. Eliza's. That's it. Eliza's Doolittle. That's a great name for a wizard, actually. You can give him a terrible Cockney accent if you really want to be My Fair Lady on it. Good morning, Daffod. We're ooh, 25 months. Dang. Thank you. Hey, Drip Marvel. Cool. Do babies like my stream the way cats like my stream? Do they like like get fascinated by the giant brush making little movements? Babies and cats have a lot in common. Just like babies and puppies have a lot in common. There, we can see the eye now. It's uh, just good enough. I've got that dark um, liner rim around it, which I want. That's about right there. We can see it. Yeah, I'm liking this face. It's gonna be a good face, I think. Hello, Toad. That's funny. I used to, <laughs> I used to joke that my dog was saying, hi, Toad, um, when she went out because she would always look for the Toads. Blazy, Kiri's daughter. It's like, I swear, if she saw a toad, she made a beeline for it. And then she would sniff it and remember, oh, this tastes bad. But it was always like, zoom, hi, toad. And then she would go away. <laughs> so I was reminded by that, of saying hello to you, toad. How to summon a lemon. All right, so getting past a giant nose like this to get the eyeball is a really hard prospect if you're trying to come from this side. So here is where it is a good idea to turn the entire miniature around so that you can come at it with no interference from the opposite side. Um, which is, weirdly enough, a thing that people don't think of uh, a lot. I'm always kind of amazed. But it's like people always are looking at their mini the right side up, and so they're actually making it harder for themselves in some ways to reach areas. Whereas if you just turn it around, sure, it feels a little bit weird, but you can get in here without having to struggle past the nose. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we're going to go kind of uh, gray blue with him. Um, Toad, what are you going to do? We're doing Templar blue, Ashen blue, 
and then two um, two Pathfinder colors. Actually, I love Pathfinder. The Pathfinder paint line has some really beautiful colors in it. So we're going to do Templar and Ashen, and we decided to go a little lighter on the lighter side too. So Akata Blue and then Irisen for the top highlight. These are all pretty colors. Are you going brighter blue or are you not going blue at all? I'm going to put my blues over here because we don't have the blues yet. So, yeah, Toad, I'm Anne. I work for Reaper, obviously. I used to work for Reaper at their headquarters, making their paint line. So I made Reaper Master Series. Um, and now I, uh, I moved out to the West Coast to be with my fiancé, my now fiancé. And so now I stream for Reaper. But if you have any questions about Master Series paint, I am still your girl. There we go. A little bit better. I lost a little bit of the inner edge of that lining, but if I'm really fast with my brush, I may be able to scrub it off. Yeah, I can. When you paint over something, often with acrylic, especially if you're using thinned paint, you have like a few seconds where you can take a damp brush and kind of scrub away a line if you line over something or you put a little bit too much white over your lining or something like that. It's really easy to correct it. The key is not to panic. Oh yeah, oh no, I forgot my ring today. Normally I flash the ring. I have it set out on my uh, my nightstand, but this morning we were kind of rushing around and so I totally forgot to put my ring on. But yes, yes, fiance. I have my shiny uh, square diamond. Um, we haven't set a date yet. It'll be it'll be next year sometime. But yes, yes, he is totally, um, he has upgraded. Yeah. We have both upgraded to having fiancés now instead of uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, respectively. White cloaking, gold trimming, hmm. Nightmare black, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's blue black. It's like, if you add some white to it, it makes it really pretty. Here, I can show you. Let's bring back Zari and her buddy, Staccato. Zari and Staccato. Zari's blacks are highlighted with nightmare black, added with pure white added, and this blue on Zari and the highlights. This blue is nightmare black plus pure white. So, so yeah, so I love using nightmare black as my highlight color on really shiny leather where you want that kind of blue tone. It's a really pretty color. Highly recommended. Zari and Staccato will hang out here. <laughs> Boy, boyfriend has evolved to fiance. Yes, exactly. I, I saved up enough candy. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. He oh, knows. Yeah, I froze. That's funny. Oh, thank you, Dwarving. Yeah, yeah. We did this on my own stream for a while. We were we were running a stream game and we were painting our characters and playing D&D &D just really informally. But yeah, she turned out really well. I really like her. It's my favorite bard character, I think. It's an Izzy Collier design, Talon design. Um, and I wanted to paint her kind of Arabic uh kind of so the skin tone was fun and yeah and the dog staccato is painted to resemble my kiri who i've uh who i've since lost so she passed on all righty but we are planning a new puppy either next year or the year after even david is getting excited for the new puppy you guys this is kind of cool because he is not, you know, he was not a dog person. He had never owned a dog until Kiri and I moved in. So it's actually really cool that he's like, I'm excited about the puppy. And I'm like, woohoo, win! Instead of, oh, so we're going to get a puppy still? <laughs> uh... Cervantes, it, it, uh, I mean, I'm no longer at the factory. So essentially they have, um, somebody else who has taken over just the day-to-day -day paint, pr paint production. Um, as far as new lines go, the only things that Ed had been talking about when I, when I moved was he was talking about maybe an airbrush line and he was talking about maybe a historical line because Ed came from the historical painting arena and he would really like to have a line that's that's you know geared toward the historical community um so those were the two things that ed always brought up before but i can't see 
I can't, and he might do a big redesign. Like he does cancel colors every once in a while. Like he took some of our really low center sellers and got rid of them um, just like a couple years ago. But when he cancels stuff, he tends to get a lot of pushback. And so I don't know, I can't say that he's never gonna cancel again, but I'm not certain how that may run. And if he does cancel, he usually just cancels like lower sellers. He doesn't like cancel entire lines. He canceled HD, but then he ended up bringing a lot of those colors back into bones. So, I mean, the overall answer is it is unpredictable and it depends on how sales are. But in general, Master Series Paint is Reaper's flagship. It still does extremely well and gains new fans every day. So I can't see HD or bones, uh, or sorry, Bones or Core going anywhere in the coming years. It's not really our audience though, Shadow Raven. That's why it, it really, oh, and how old the Master Paint line is. It is, oh uh, boy, I was 17 years at Reaper. I started work on it at the end of my first year. So 15 to 16 years, but then it's been two years since then because I moved on. It's almost my 18 year anniversary. I'm gonna say 16 and a half is how old the, ma the Master Series paint line is. I started working on it. It was one of my original job uh, descriptions to, to create that. And I started working on it toward the end of my first year at Reaper. And then it took us about six months of R&D and experimentation to settle on the, the bases that we want and start formulating the first colors. So by the second or third ReaperCon, I think is when we had, may have been the second ReaperCon where we had, yeah, must have been, um, where we had prototypes at the second ReaperCon. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think that was kind of the thinking. Um, Twisted Oma is like, we, we have the Vex now, and so creating an airbrush line to market it to go with the Vex makes a lot of sense. Um, I know Ed had some people working on it since I, you know, I abandoned them <laughs> too. Plus I was never, um, I could have figured out, I had some ideas about how we could do an airbrush line, but, uh, Ed, at last I checked, he was uh, actually working with some other historical painters and airbrush painters to try to figure out a good consistency and stuff like that. But that's just what was happening a year and a half ago. And, you know, when I left Reaper, which would have been April, 2020, so it, it, things change at Reaper. Reaper is part of the reason that Reaper is still alive and prosperous as a company is that Reaper understands how to pivot and we're still small enough that we can pivot. So if something that we've been developing isn't feasible or we have a new direction that pops up that seems more urgent, Reaper will pivot to that direction. So, and, and we've got a fairly small staff. So our priorities, like we have to like really prioritize. And that means that some ideas don't see the light of day for five, six, or even 10 years. So all these things uh, with Reaper. But yeah, I know Ed was very keen on an airbrush paint line. So don't be surprised if that becomes to be a thing, but it also don't be surprised if it, it might take a while. I'm gonna actually take this Cairn Stone and Desert Sand and uh, put a base coat down. Actually, you know what? That's really pale. Hmm, well, I can shade it, I guess. I like to start with light colors. I tend to like to start darker and work up. Well, I'm gonna finish painting this page, but I might paint it over. Cause that's more like a highlight color and not necessarily the color I wanna start with, but hey. It made sense because I had the colors sitting there staring at me and it is like a good color for book pages if the book pages are fairly fresh. Well, I still am an employee. So like I'm an actually still on the payroll. I'm not a freelancer. So technically I haven't, I, I haven't had to cut off my, like how many years have I been at Reaper? Um, it'll be 19, sorry, 19 years this April guys that I've worked for Reaper Miniatures. Almost my 20th, like my 20th, I'm going to have to go back to Texas and tell Ed he has to take me out to lunch. <laughs> Let's see here. What do I want to do for that? I think I want to do shield brown. So if I want this book to look older, then I'm going to want to start a little darker. Um, so I want kind of a caramel color. So using shield brown plus maybe this desert sand or maybe this, um, the rich leather has a lot of yellow in it. So maybe a combo of these. I'm gonna grab one drop of shield brown, one drop of desert sand, and one drop of rich leather. I'm gonna see what color they make. Um, 
Um, I think that for sheer toughness and adhesion, the white is better. The white is actually um, a formulation that will stick to glass. Like, and glass is entirely non-porous. So I find that the Reaper regular primer, shake it really, really well and thin it a little bit. It will glob up detail. So I usually will thin it at least like six to one or five to one. And you can always put a second coat on if you want a really tough seal. But shake the bejeebus out of it because it's so fine in order to be able to stick as well as it does. The resin is so fine that it does fall out of solution. It does take a bit of shaking. Just be aware. But yeah, when I use our primers, I use our white. Unless I need, unless I've done a spray black and I just need a touch up, in which case then I use our black primer. But if I'm going to use brush on from Reaper, I tend to use white. A lot of people really like our black primer because it's got a really good finish to it, but, and it covers really well. But uh, I think the white is actually a better adhesion. In my opinion. Just understanding the chemistry of it. Yeah, there's a really nice uh, restaurant down in Fort Worth that I like. Maybe I'll uh, have to tell Ed and Dave that we have to go to Riata. We should just have a little, a little dinner, a little, little small Reaper Reaper dinner with like Ed and Dave and Ron and their wives or attachments. That could be fun. But yeah, it'll be it'll be spring next year. It's and my and my work anniversary is actually the best work anniversary ever, which is April Fool's Day. You never are quite sure whether you really got a job or not when you show up for your first day of work. <laughs> the prices are listed on the menu at Riata, but I love Riata, so I'm I'm okay with that. We can just uh we can just go with that. I, menus without prices on them make me nervous because my dad was always very critical of me choosing expensive things on the menu. He always said, he always complained that I had the most expensive tastes because no matter what I looked at, inevitably it was the most expensive thing anybody else was ordering. So he made me really self-conscious about it over the years. So yeah, menus without prices on them make me super nervous. Not something I enjoy. Blame my dad. Okay, so so those are your cho your choices. Now a lot of people would start with this base coat, and you really would need to shade pretty dramatically to get this to have like a rich kind of vellum color to it. It's very pasty, so you'd have to add a lot of layers of shading to really bring it down. So for me, the easy way, the easier way, is to start with your shadow color and then highlight up instead, and leave a bit of this in the cracks so you get that brown and yellow aged look and you can if you want a really aged book you want to darken it even more um, for those of you on my patreon patreon.com uh, painting big i did do a video on books on painting old books that i think is one of the best videos i've ever done to the patreon i believe it was a like a last year video it was before we got our new place um, you could find it if you go to my Discord and uh, you can find it in the Patreon directory there. Oh, and somebody did email me yesterday asking for the link to the Discord who was a patron but hadn't signed up. Uh, I'll get back to you if you're watching this. I just haven't had time. Last night was busy because we went out and then uh, I haven't gotten to my email today yet. I try to hold off on email till later in the day. I find it aids my productivity. There we go. Got all this nice brown. Sweet. You know what else I could paint with that pink, though? Because we always like to repeat colors on the model. We could paint our tail. The tail of the little mousy. Or the rat. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, uh, D. Clearman. Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> Zen bacon. <laughs> oh dear. So yeah, I'm going to make the tail pink. That way we're reusing the same color. We have the color open on our palette, so it makes sense to just do it. That way we don't have to remix that because it was kind of a pain to mix. And I can really highlight it with any light pink, or I can just go in with the skin tone and do it. I, I do, I understand that rat tails are actually more fleshy and less pink, but it's cute to make them pink, and so I do. There, we have a nice little, and probably his little ears are going to have little pink insides. And his ears on this side. There, he's really cute, and his little feet. And his other little foot. And I can use some lining to come in and make these uh, stand out after I do them. There, and then his little paws. Paw number one, paw number two. Little pink paws. Adorbs. I'm thinking I want to make him a hooded rat. I haven't decided whether he's going to be a gray or a tan. I kind of am going toward tan, but it depends on what will show up. Gray might be better. Painting tiny books is the right... Yeah, I think it is painting tiny, tiny books. Yep. Yeah, $10 tier. Mm-hmm. So if you're on the Patreon and you're at that tier, I did a painting tiny books that has all sorts of really cool stuff, like old book type stuff. This is probably going to be a fresher book. But there are a lot of things you can do to age books and make them look really cool, and I talk about it in that video. But anyway, and thank you again. I always give a thank you, and it's really, really meant a thank you to all of you who do support me on Patreon. You make what I do possible. Like, absolutely feasibly you do. I could not do this. I couldn't do this stream every day. I'd have to get a real job. Yeah, nobody wants a real job. <laughs> and does not want to return to corporate America. Thank you for making it possible for me to ignore corporate America and not return to it. <laughs> There we go. Cause uh, we we are we, now that we have we've locked into a house, so I'm not going to be moving back to Texas to get my job with Reaper again if I have to stop uh, doing this. I'm gonna have to get a quote unquote real job. So happily, the Patreon is very healthy, and so it seems like I can continue to be a freelancer for a while. Yeah, it depends on if um, if it was a white mouse, definitely a pink nose. But if it's a hooded rat, um, they tend to have a colored face with a kind of a streak that goes down their back and the rest of the rat is white. But then they don't have necessarily, they probably have a tiny pink nose. Some of them don't though. It depends on the pigmentation. If it's going to be a tan color, then we will have a pink nose. I guess I'll paint it pink just because it might be. We can always paint over it. But you really see, um, usually it's lighter pigmentation that you get that pink snout. Oh, I know. No, I worked at, I worked for Equifax once upon a time. I have worked in the real corporate, corporate America, um, the credit bureau monstrosity. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to go back, please. I don't want to go back. I enjoy what I do. I love that I can finally spend hours teaching miniature painting. Like, this is the one thing, I was talking about this a bit yesterday on my personal stream, but that the one thing I felt I never had time to do at Reaper was to really explain how to use the paint and to talk about, you know, to give lessons and to help people troubleshoot. And now with the Patreon and with this, I can, finally. So that is really important to me. So I really, I really enjoy what I do now. Oh, afraid that I stream each day. Yeah. Well, why not? There's so much to teach. Every model, no matter if you're repeating the same techniques or not, every model teaches you something different. This is why I always tell you guys, like when you're done with a model, just move on to the next one. Don't try to touch it up and repaint and do all this stuff. If you're going to repaint a sculpt, wait a year 
and then repaint the sculpt. And you probably will astonish yourself on how much you've improved. But just because each model teaches you specific things and you always learn new things with every model you do, just because even if you're doing the same darn techniques over and over, you will apply them differently. You will have to change some things. You will have to figure out a new way to do something. And so just painting different models, even especially like different scales or sizes, different colors. This is why you don't want to be in a color rut. All that stuff uh, is going to make you get better. No, I went when it was down at the bottom. Um, it's a, just a wonderful restaurant. It's got lovely food. Like I, I love the way they do their, their food. I've only ever had, I took David there once actually when we were, uh, how when we were back, I think for ReaperCon or ArtistCon. Blue skin. Yeah. Um, blue skin. I mean, skin is skin. The highlights go in the same place, but doing blue, doing colored skin tones is a different animal. I think I've done, haven't I done blue skin? Yeah, I did. I have done it on, on, on again, a Patreon video. I'm just adding a little bit stuff to more, uh, more liner to my mix, by the way, because I want to line around these pages and they're on the feet. Switch over to the Patreon instead of the Twitch, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite Fort Worth restaurant. Now I haven't gone to a ton of restaurants in Fort Worth, but Riata is just, it's a, one of my friends who also teaches at ReaperCon, Brian Pearsall, um, they live in Fort Worth and Riata is like one of his top restaurants and he's pretty picky. So that's where I, that's why I, we originally went is that his, um, his wife, uh, they were having an anniversary, I think, and that was the restaurant they chose. And uh, so we went down and I really love it. It's very Texas. If you want to go to to a place that screams Texas, but that um, that has super high quality cooking as well and food and great cocktails, very extensive cocktail bar and wine bar, wine list. Um, yeah, Riata. Well, that's why they, um, that's why they hired me. Ironically, I always joke that they just certainly, that they hired me, uh, for my personality and, and regretted it ever since, <laughs> but I didn't get hired because I was a good painter. I didn't get hired. I mean, they didn't even know that I could really create paint at that point. I didn't get hired for that. Um, they hired me because they wanted a personality that could teach. That was exactly why I was originally hired for Reaper Turgeon was not my, uh, my other assets, but uh, purely because I had that teaching personality. Yeah, Dwarving, you really, you just don't learn a lot. Like you need, at that point, you need to step back in my experience and get some perspective and work on something different. Um, because like it's you are at one stage of your painting career. A year from now, you may be at a completely different evolution of your painting career, and you'll be able to take on that model, a new copy of it, and just destroy it and make it, in fact, like fantastic, like notably different. And you just don't, you know, you got to give yourself time and work on some other stuff. I really feel it's counterproductive to just hang up on one model. Like I, I feel like it is a never a good tactic. Like I would go that far and there's almost no nevers in my world. Like I always will, will save room for um, the possibility that I'm incorrect. But there I've seen too many people get burned out and just self-destruct their painting for months because they get hung up on one figure. Uh, so I, I have to say that I feel it is never a good tactic to do that. You learn so much more switching it up. especially if it's something that's frustrating you. I mean, there are times in your life and things and situations where you definitely don't want to get off the horse, right? You want to get back on the horse. But in this case, the horse really isn't the miniature. The horse is your painting. And so the answer is, is less to focus on the mini and more to focus on overall progress, I think. That's just my perspective, of course. Here we got some shadows in there so his little feet stand out.
<laughs> you feel called out. <laughs> yeah, Sadie is not there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was an announcement uh, several months ago, Crowley. So I believe that um, Reaper always has a, a number of artistic people working at it because especially uh, people like that are into working with metals and stuff um, will come and work in our casting department. Like we always, we almost always have UNT art students um, and often they are good at other stuff as well. So last I checked, Ed was training an art student to do the basic paint production. Keep in mind that the basic paint production is not that difficult because you are formulas for everything. So you have to learn some pigment interaction uh, so that you can, you know, adjust formulas. But I mean, you can, you can learn it. It's not hard. Uh, it just takes time. But who knows? Ed may be still looking for somebody to like take over my position, I'm not sure. So there's the frowny face on the rat. I think that that the whimsy has left the department with the department with the departure of Sadie, unless unless they find somebody equally whimsical. I mean, I kind of feel like whimsy is like a necessary quality in the paint department. Maybe it's just me, but that maybe that's just, you know, the way I roll. All right, so I've got those little, little things lined. I'm gonna line between the little paws so that they stand out. I've lined underneath the, uh, the paws as well to make them stand out that way. I'm gonna put a little tiny liner shadow along the top of the ear. And this is where your brush control really comes to your rescue when you're doing these tiny little things so work on your brush control, like the fundamentals, going back to fundamentals, like brush control, like paint consistency, like brush loading and unloading. Really cementing those. That's going to do more for your painting than trying to figure out how to do NMM or lighting effects. I mean, we love to do those things because they're fun. but they're also conceptually difficult, especially if you don't have the fundamentals. Oh, I think actually, well, nope, that's the book still. His haunch comes up over it. Bryn, okay, she's mixing now. Good, yeah, she sounded like she was a good fit for it. That's great. All right, so we're lining there. We're lining wherever one thing meets another. Wherever one surface or texture drops off and another one starts. So even though the tail is part of the rat, I'll still line there, just with a slight line. Now with something super heavy. There, and then we got an eyeball on this side. And then a frowny face, and then another frowny face. Now the rat has frowny face on both sides. Excellent. And this side of the paw needs to be lined. Excellent. Hey, we're moving right along here. But yeah, the paint department, like, it's just you have to be organized to stay on top of it. There's a lot of things you have to juggle. It took me years to, like, effectively juggle the paint department. And it helped that I was there from when it was tiny up until when it was immensely huge. And, uh, like, the amount of paint that we had to put out was immensely huge with tons of products and Kickstarters. But... If you've got somebody who's looking for a challenge, it can be that, and it can be very rewarding to stay on top of it. I always found it very rewarding to be on top of this big moving part that was an assembly of other tiny moving parts. I do miss mix, uh, making, I miss making new colors. That's the best part. There we 
just put that line between the book and the wizard. I'm going to actually just kind of get some, uh, I'm going to thin down that liner a little bit and just kind of put a general shadow. I tend to do that if it's like up against the underside of something here. I'll just block in, kind of underpaint a bit of shadow to darken down that area. There's a lot of folds right there. And the book is held up against him, so it's going to be a darker area. Blocking a lot of shot shadows on this guy, just, uh, it's kind of fun to do that. Like, this is the opposite underpainting that I usually do. Usually with underpainting, I'm starting dark and then I'm sketching in with white. But on this guy, because he's kind of a pale gray, I'm adding in shadows with underpainting, um, which is my brown liner and doing it the other way around, essentially. Um, which is nice. It kind of lets me see, just like, just like sketching in highlights lets you see the light. Sketching in shadows lets you define form and shape and substance and mass um, and figure out like where your dark shadows are, define various areas. It's very useful in a totally different way. But just like underpainting that dark shadow on the sleeve like brings that whole area out a bit more. I don't often do dark underpainting, so it's kind of fun to do it on this mini for you guys. He just seems to lend himself to that. And part of it is that we're thinking of going fairly light with his clothing. Um, so I know I'm gonna be going light, and so underpainting with darker colors seems like a good way to start out. We also have to figure out a color for his sash. And I'm about ready to actually start on the blue. I think we're gonna do that. There we go. Yeah, let's start on the blue. We've got everything lined on Mr. Ratty, except I suppose I could line his tail just a little bit. The sleeve shadow? I mean, it's really, uh, sleeves are easier. I used this model as my from in my uh, Patreon Pentads video. It's easier than you think it is. Although I do see a mold line. I'm gonna stop and get that. Is it a mold line? Sometimes it's so hard to tell on areas like this, if it's just trim and if it's supposed to be kind of like a dual, dual toned trim or if it's supposed to be smooth and that's a mold line. It's, you have to kind of just choose one and commit. Okay. I think it is actually two strands. I don't think it's a mold line. I think it's actually sculpted that way, but I've got a couple of little artifact divots on here that I'm gonna try to take out. There we go. Trying to take a little bit of this extra, like there's some little rough spots here. Just gotta be real good with my knife. There we go. Okay, let us. Yeah, you could do that. You get a more complex shadow if you use a brown, a naturalistic shadow. Blue shadows on, or shadows on blue cloth are seldom blue. They tend to gray or brown out. All right, so now, now we have to ask ourselves, do we want to start with our darkest color or with more of a mid color or do we want to start light? Do you guys have an opinion? Remember, if whatever we start as is going to influence the entire thing. He's really pale so far. We've got a really pale book and we're going to probably have a pale wrap, but we'll see. Oh, the sleeve shadow? Honestly, you don't need to do very much to it, Bull. I mean, what I find is it's the same thing. Inside of sleeves is the same thing as underneath a robe. You block it in dark. When I take the blue or whatever my edging color is here, I'm going to layer it into that dark and just kind of have it fade, but I'm going to leave that dark like right inside. It's actually pretty easy. Um, actually, Kaz, it's harder normally. Okay, so 
If you're starting with a really dark blue like Ritterlich, it's harder to start dark because those tend to be transparent. Here, our darkest color still has white in it. So we are, uh, we're not going to go like terribly dark. You guys said you wanted a lighter and a little bit of a, you wanted, you wanted Templar and Ashen. So you didn't want a super dark blue. So that's what we're going. We're not going to go dark, but we will go, we can start with Templar and go up. So. No, but the rat, whether the rat goes light or dark is going to be influenced by how light or dark the robes are. And that's just color composition. So, okay, so people want darker. We will start darker. We'll start with Templar. Normally, like I said, the problem with starting with a really dark blue um, is that blue is translucent. Like the pigment for blue is not high coverage typically. And it's very, very like rich, right? It's got that deep vibrancy to it. But when you add white to that to try to build highlights, you instantly change that transparent quality and interfere with it. So you almost always, always will produce brush strokes when you try to do that blending from that really dark color on up to the color with white in it, even if that is also a dark blue. So the way to get around that is to actually start in the middle and work down, work shade down, because then the transparency in the really dark blue works for you because you're trying to layer with that color to bring in darker shadows. And so transparency when you're layering is a bonus, not a, not a problem. So you essentially want to start in the way that gives you the best chance to successfully execute. Blue can be a real pain when you're doing a really dark vivid blue or deep vivid blue that has zero white in it. Like mix a little white into it. Start with that and then go back in with your really dark transparent blue. Don't do it the other way around or you will want to just like throw yourself off a cliff. Like I have done this on a 54 millimeter night before I made this mistake. I will never make it again. All right, so we will start with, it, it, Templar is, is different because Templar has a little bit of white in it already. I mean, you can tell, right? It's not like, blue's natural pigment is really dark. If you look at clear blue, how dark that is, that's blue's natural state, at least thalo blue. Um, and so Templar already has some white in it, which means we're gonna have no trouble blending up from it whatsoever. Templar is actually one of my uh, favorite blues. It's one of the, I love bl gray blues and that was the first, like I got to actually design a gray blue that I really loved. And I was the one who designed the Templar army for Warlord, so, or wrote the army book. So I was like picking, I got to pick the color that the faction would be and that was, that was my choice. That was why it was Templar blue. Um, let me see here, where is my water? Water, where'd you go? Oh no, ah, there it is. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of knowledge drop and uh, pigment characteristics. Part of the reason for that is because blue has such a small pigment grind. And so that's what gives it that transparency and vibrancy and gives it that beautiful depth. But the minute you throw white into that, you, it, you'll you see the shift right away. Like the whole color will change. I don't care if you just put a tiny bit in, you'll see, you'll see it. Um, and so it's, it's really where if you want that to work with that really translucent blue, you got to go at it backwards. You got to start with an, a blue that has white in it and then just work it down. Whether you use washes or glazes or layering or whatever, work down and it's going to make it so much easier for you to work back up. Yeah, blue is my most hated color to paint because of that, because I tend to love dark, vibrant blues and they are such a pain to work with when you're trying to get smooth blending. Well, I'm thinking we're going to maybe put some texture on his robes, so we'll see. All right. I think we've got a good start on that base coat. Let's go ahead and go there. At least get some blue on this model before we have to end the stream. That was my goal in the first, uh, from the first, and yet I ended up messing with the skin tones and uh, filling in books and rats. Oh, my. So let's get this pretty color on there. I love this color blue. I love it, I love it, I love it. If you don't have Templar Blue, pick it up. So pretty. 
So very pretty. And I'm thinning it. It's about, eh, I think I went a little thicker than I usually do. I think it's about five to one. No, maybe four to one. Four or five to one is my usual base coat consistency. It, as you can see, it's quite fluid, but it covers decently. This is pretty much what I asked my base coat to do. I don't mind if I have to uh, touch it up after one layer. I don't mind that at all. I just want it to have decent coverage so I can kind of see the color out the gate. And I want it to be smooth. So any little uh, imperfections you're noticing are actually little bits of plastic imperfections from my quickie, quickie cleaning of this model. Yeah, now I'm really seeing some of the quickie stuff. So I'm gonna actually bring my knife in and uh, take care of those real quick. Um, you always go thinner for highlights, War Shadow, because highlights have white in them. The minute you put white in, you add opacity. So if you want your highlights to blend at all, you must go thinner, not thicker. Unless you're trying to create a very strong textured effect. But if you're trying to make it at all smooth, not even perfectly smooth, but just generally smooth, you need to, uh, need to thin it. You can sometimes go a little thicker with shadows because shadows are naturally usually a bit more, those colors or darker colors are naturally a little more translucent because they don't have that white paint, that white pigment that's gonna give you coverage. So given that, you can go thinner with your shadows or thicker, sorry, with your shadows because the paint goes see-through a lot easier. Yeah, I, that sleeve is gonna annoy me, but I'm gonna run it. Yeah, I could have put a coat of sealer on here. I just didn't because I was lazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that brings up something. My own personal stream, uh, because because I was streaming, you know, on Thursdays on my own personal stream. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of you are still at work and everything. And it wasn't a great day for me. I really need to do some stuff like update my website and things like that. I need to free up a day for that. So I'm going to be moving my personal stream to Saturdays. Um, it'll be at about the same time, so about 4 p.m. or a little bit before USA Central. But then maybe more people can actually, it can almost be like paint club is kind of my goal. Like, I just get on and if you want to you want to sit and talk to me and paint while we're painting, like, do it. So that won't be this weekend because we're, oh, and it's not going to be next to, obviously I did a stream already this week, but and next weekend we're going to be in Carmel. But um, I'll remind you guys in a couple weeks. And maybe more of you will be able to watch. Yeah, sealer is really good for that. I mean, gloss sealer would work also. I just was lazy on this one. I tend to be a little lazy on these models and I tend to pay for it later um, with having to uh, do prep after, reprep after the fact if I'm gonna give it to Ron. Um, depends on the model. So our main robe is gonna be blue and then we're gonna have to think about other stuff once I get this blocked in so I can kind of see the color composition and how it's going. Good deal. Yeah, that's kind of what I was hoping. Actually, it was you saying that, Crows, that gave me the idea. Because I used to do paint club every Saturday. I worked six days a week because of that, but I didn't so much mind it. I got to work on my own projects and stuff, just like I do on my stream. So I was thinking that if I did it Saturday, maybe people could actually sit and paint while we chat and stuff and might even lead to some good questions because you'd be working on stuff and maybe would have a question occur to you while you were working. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. So I think uh, around the, uh, what, the 20th? The weekend of the 20th-ish, ish? -ish? I've totally lost my calendar in my head. Boom, ah, boom, there we go. Yeah, 
I think so. Let me see if anything is on the 20th. Nope, I'm free. So yeah, starting the 20th. Yeah, hoping Twitch reminders do the do the job. Oh yeah. Yeah, dwarving. The 3D prints can be, especially when they've got little fiddly bits, it can be so hard. I agree. Oh, you could. Yeah, in the new game store, you could put it on the TV, John. Good idea. I'll have to wash my mouth. Then I have to have my family filter on. <laughs> I should anyway on a Saturday because there could be kids watching. Yeah, I'll um I'll also make a post about it, D. Clearman, um, for my Patreon. Just to, I try to post on my Patreon to let people know when there's a change in my schedule. So that we'll do that. Don't worry. So you get that reminder as well. Yeah, I used to do four hours of paint club every Saturday at Reaper. We'd just go into the game store. We got to use the break room. Everybody just sat and painted. It was fun. But now with the magic of like not in personness that we all learned during pandemic, maybe it makes sense to have a virtual paint club. Yeah, that's what I've been using lately, even on Bones USA, D. Clearman. The electric nail file. On resin. It's beautiful on resin and metal. There we are. How's our color composition looking? I need to get the interior of that sleeve. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Shadow Raven. It's like the great thing about Paint Club was that you it made you kind of assign time every week to paint. Whether you're just working on stuff for your D&D game or trying to paint a board game that you really like or, you know, working on stuff for RCL, um, for Reaper Challenge League, or or trying to, like, actually get better and work on, a like, a higher-end piece just for you, like, it would be useful. It's, it was useful just to have the time every week that you went and just painted. Like, a lot of people, when we, I was at Paint Club when I was still running it at Reaper, a lot of people said they really appreciated that because it was hard for them to make time for to paint when they were at home because there were so many distractions. And so having Paint Club gave them an excuse to sit down and, and just reserve like an, a couple hours maybe for painting. Ooh, Reaper Challenge League. Hey, where's the link? Uh, Reaper Challenge League, I think, does monthly challenges to paint a specific model or in specific colors or there's like different things. You can do teams, you can do multiple figures, you can, there's, it's crazy. I, I honestly don't have the time for it, so I can't tell you everything, but there's the link um, to Reaper Challenge League. But essentially it's a good tool if you just want to paint more. Like Reaper Challenge League is a great motivator if you just want to paint more minis. And you, and you want something to motivate you to, uh, to paint. And it's, it's nice because there's, you know, everybody's painting, you know, along the same kind of thing each month. And uh, it can be, if you're a competitive person, it can, it can get, you know, get that moving in you and uh, be a good motivator. But even if you just want to paint and you just want an excuse, it's, at least it gives you a deadline um, and it gives you a little bit of creative push to you to sit and paint. So generally a great idea that Reaper came up with there. Especially if you've got a bunch of Bones minis that you have to get painted, which many of us do. Yeah. 
Beef it up and do more with it. Good. Yeah, I was going to say, everybody really likes it. Like, I haven't heard a single person, like, say say that they don't, aren't enjoying it. And you're only competing with yourself. Right. But you can also, you know, maybe throw in a challenge with a friend, right? It's like, hey, let's both do this. And then the challenge is just to complete the challenge, the competition. Or you could make it a bet. It's like, let's do the Reaper Challenge League. And if either of us doesn't finish, he has to buy the other one lunch. <laughs> Yeah, definitely beef it up, John. It's a really good idea. Anything that gets people, like, excited about painting and motivated to paint and maybe try some new things, like a new color or a miniature they might not otherwise have picked up, like, all that stuff, obviously, is just fantastic. Anything that adds more fun to the hobby, which is already so fun. There we go. So I think that's all the blue bits right now at least it's all of these blue bits and then we have to ask ourselves if we're going to make even more blues of different colors elsewhere theater curtains february is coming up yes february finger painting <laughs> oh dear <laughs> Alrighty. That's pretty good. Oh, yep, we got 10 minutes left. What am I going to do in my 10 minutes? I think I'm going to ask myself, do I want to highlight, kind of see what the color is going to turn into when I highlight? I think I do. I could pick a, a darker shadow to go with this, but I kind of was going to use uh, Templar as my shadow. So I'm going to grab my Ashen Blue and do a test and see, see how my blue looks when I put some uh, like a, my mid-tone in, essentially. We're painting dark to light on this model. Which is, again, something I don't typically do. Typically, I start with my mid, and then I shade down, and then I highlight up. But, yeah, I used to paint dark, dark to light all the time. It just feels funny to me. It feels really weird. Name this paint wrong answers only. Ed would love that. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff like that. I mean, it won't make you a better painter, but you'll have fun with your hobby, and that's the important part. All right, so my ashen blue. So the difference between those two colors, you can see ashen is quite a bit lighter. There are triads. There are several triads, especially early in the Master Series line, where you really should probably do a half and half mix between them. Um, you don't really have to with ashen, but it may help it um, blend a little bit better. Let's get this palette out of frame and see, see what my consistency is like. I'll usually test my layering consistency to see if it's about where I want it. Um, this is giving me some streakiness, so it's not going to smoothly blend if you see streakiness. But you could also just kind of layer it up until that streakiness disappears. And then you can take your Templar Blue and come back at it from the other direction to blend it in. Which is a tool that I didn't use for a long time, but I do it quite a bit now. Um, is coming at coming back at a color from the opposite side with the dark color to uh, mess up that edge and make it blend better. And I'm going horizontally over the fold. The reason for that is that it confuses the eye. It also is useful if you're trying to do texture on the cloth. You can leave. Yeah, see, I've got, definitely can see my brush strokes here. Definitely can. So that's not ideal layering consistency, but I'm gonna run with it because mostly right now I just wanna test and see what my color, my actual cloth color is gonna start to look like as I bring in this ash and blue. Because, of course, it's going to cover up a lot of the Templar. It's going to make everything go lighter, as you can see. He's going to definitely feel like a frost wizard, I get the feeling. 
by the time we're done. Because we're going to go high enough up that this is going to be a very cold, wintry color. So maybe he's a, it's, maybe it's timely. Like maybe we're painting a, a wizard, a wizard of winter. In which case the, the mouse should totally have a little sweater on. Or the rat, rather. And I'm just going to build this color up. So when you layer, a lot of people will just do one layer, and then they'll go on to the next color and make a layer of that, and they'll do a next color and make a layer of that. But in reality, you sometimes get the best results by doing multiple layers with a single color. Because if you've thinned your paint a lot, which with layering you tend to do, the first layer you put down over your base coat, especially when you're building up from dark to light, isn't going to be the full strength of the color that you actually have in the palette. Instead, you have to do a couple layers, right? Because it's kind of a thin paint. And so after the third layer, you'll finally start to see it look like real ash and blue. So don't think that you, like, do, do consider that sometimes another layer or two layers of the same highlight color might be a better choice than trying to create a new highlight color that's even lighter and applying that. Because until you've got your first highlight pretty solid, it may look too stark to try to take it up another level. You may get more results. Oh yeah, thanks for hanging around, crows. Yeah, a tiny rat sweater, exactly. If only I had time to sculpt it. But then we'd have to paint his hat red with a white brim and put a little pom-pom at the end. <laughs> Make him a Christmas wizard. <laughs> and a little Santa hat on the mouse. We could go there, it would be kind of cute. It would, it would totally take any sinister undertones out of this model and, uh, and make it way too cute. That's just my opinion. So I want to show you guys something about how colors influence each other on the model, even when they're not right next to each other. So if I cover up the book, the skin is looking a lot warmer, like, like it might actually be pale skin tones, and I probably need to add a little pink here just to some of the uh, area on the hand. But still, when you bring this in, though, it really bleaches out. It goes very bone colored and it's a subtle shift, but it happens. And the problem what's happening here is that this brown right now is so warm that it's totally taking the skin tone really much colder than it is. Any hint of the brown color in the skin tone is washed out completely by the fact that this is a more intense, warm and large brown area. So when I lighten this book up, I'm probably going to want to gray it out a little bit and make sure that it doesn't totally wash out and make his skin look dead white. So this is an example of everything on the model is going to influence everything else as far as the color. Um, and having, if I had gone gray with this, then the face would be reading as the warmest part of the model. So remember that every choice you make impacts every other choice on the model. And sometimes you'll want that. Like I really want him to look kind of undead or really, really suspect. Um, then maybe I embrace that. I'm going to bring in just a little bit pink in the palm of the hand. And I want a little bit, often on the, you'll get a little bit of pink around the knuckles, especially the knuckles like right, see the pink tones through here? So the first set of knuckles. So it's a good thing to maybe paint in a little bit of rosy color there. Bring that in. And sometimes the fingertips also. 
Just bring it in a little bit because the face got those rosy tones and I didn't add any to the hands, so it was looking like a disembodied hand. I need to add a little bit to the hand underneath also. But yeah, we're pretty much ending the stream at this point, my friends. It was lovely to hang out with all of you. I'm just gonna put some pink tones right down there. And we got it everywhere. We can de-emphasize the pink that we just splashed on too. This is just me like popping colors on. Don't overthink stuff like this. Just put a touch of it there. You can always come back and highlight it and take it a little bit more subtle, um, but get it in place. Get it in place so that you, you have it to work with. Um, all right, so we talked about a lot today. We talked about color composition and we talked about um, underpainting and we talked about skin tones and eye co like colors to use on the balls of the eyes and we made lots of jokes about wizards with, with familiars who are better at magic than them and stuff like that. Well, a lot of older people do. And right, he sits and he sits and, and reads books all day. So, but yeah, so this is going to be a more muted figure, which is fine because we have a couple. We've got our ogre is a very saturated figure and our tiffling is also. So, uh, so this is a good to have a kind of a more muted color scheme on this guy today. So yeah, we've got a lot of color choices yet to make. Um, I have some ideas, but I'll have to think about it. But yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks for hanging out, Dwarving. We, en we enjoyed your company and your comments. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you come to an and stream. If you haven't watched for a while, you have to like take lots of notes. Ah, Raid Moonlight Minis. Oh yeah, Christine. Oh yay. Awesome. Yeah, and then Reaperland at 3 p.m. Central. So yeah, say hi to Christine. She's so awesome. I'm glad she's streaming now. That's fantastic. Awesome. All right, guys. Have a great one. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Please enjoy yourselves. Get some painting done. And we will be back on Monday with Bronze Gollum. All right. Have a great one. Bye-bye.